theme of today, hmm. entrepreneur education and entrepreneurship in fragile states. And perhaps we could even argue that some of our neighborhoods are have um, characteristics of fragile states. Hmm. Um, is it? I mean, I felt in some of the introductions this morning and also this afternoon that people believe that education and entrepreneurship is a way to counter violent extremism. How do you perceive this? Well, you would think so, but I don't actually think it is. I think it's, um, it looks as if some aspects of it could be very important. And it's not the entrepreneurship in itself, because as we've seen from and heard from other speakers, entrepreneurs fail. So the disappointment that can emerge from that could also be a motivation to become radicalized. And since more fail than succeed, you could argue that entrepreneurship is actually a problem. However, I think it comes down to a state of mind which is seminal to entrepreneurship, which is the ability to negotiate. And this is, I think, the best kept secret in the West. We're okay, then we'll repeat that one. <laughs> the ability to negotiate, what do you mean with this? Well, we're sitting in the exact spot, the oldest stock exchange in the world, where the um, Amsterdam DNA took root. And it was based on three different characteristics. One was the negotiation from international trade. The second was the cooperation from the Polder model and the ability to actually relate to each other, which created a level of business trust. And these qualities became embedded in the society. Now, I think that what's so interesting about entrepreneurship is actually the ones that fail are very often the ones that are not very good at negotiating. And it is actually negotiation that is the driver of democracy because it's based on one fundamental idea above all others, which is at the heart of democratic values, and that's compromise. And if you can't compromise, you won't have a democracy. So in that sense, we should encourage entrepreneurs not so much to understand just the figures, but actually how to negotiate. But that can be taught. And we've yes. been learning this morning and also this afternoon about all kinds of educational programs where leadership, empowerment, resilience are at the core of the programs. Mm. Um, so education could be part of counter-radicalization. It's a should huge be. part, and you, you can't start early enough. But I'm not just talking about business success. I mean cultures that learn how to negotiate. If you look at the US now, if you look at the way democracies in the West because we are now in the front line of this uh, psychological war, are fracturing under polarization. We are not negotiating with each other. We're not having the conversations we should with each other. And if you look at the US, for example, the, uh, there's nothing much to negotiate because the side isn't talking to the other. Well, I think if you were to ask Mr. Trump, he would probably consider himself the top number one negotiator of the country, but he has a zero-sum game of looking at things. I mean, he negotiates until he wins. Um, I think we're all going to see very soon just how bad he is. Uh, and I, I noticed that this morning he was criticized for um, the uh, defections he's already getting within his uh, ability to appoint new people. And he tweeted that, it's all right, everyone, don't worry, I know who the finalists are. Now, that implies it's a reality TV show, mm -hmm. the finalists. These are his pick for Secretary mm -hmm. of State. He, he's out of his depth. I would like to take you back from the States to the Netherlands and to our own neighborhoods. I know that you're advisor to many uh, mayors and municipalities. Mm -hmm. What can we learn in our own neighborhoods here in our own country from the experiences you have and have seen, you know, your experiences in Ireland, in Baghdad, in, in your long life of you know, promoting negotiation as a way to move forward? I think the critical thing is preventing community radicalization. And to do that, we have to prevent polarization. And to do that, we have to hold the center. If the political center doesn't hold, and I don't mean the institutions, I mean the mindset that unites a people, we run the risk of polarization, and polarization very quickly starts to lead to radicalization. Well, now you have to explain that to me, because I do believe in the uh, golden rule, sort of, uh, that you want what you want for yourself, uh, wanted for others as well. I mean, mm. the golden rule in almost every religion, although sometimes with birthday presents, I feel that somebody gave me a present they wanted and not wanted <laughs> to give to me, but that's another discussion. Um, 
So the road of the middle, the middle road, mm. how do we maintain that? What do we need? What we do we need here, NGOs, uh, government officials, business people? How can we show leadership in this? Mm. I think the key thing is to um, promote the idea of equality, equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity. Yes. And I think the countries which have the greatest sense of equality have the most stable democracies and they have the fewest problems with radicalization. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are all kinds of ways you can cut this. I mean, in Iraq, for example, there was a sectarian inequality. Uh, the, the financial one was not so important. In other countries, it's a financial inequality. In others, it's just pure and simply uh, Islamophobia and xenophobia. Uh, fear of the other, fear of outsiders. I think that we have to bite the bullet and realize the world is changing. And if we don't understand um, uh, exactly what the, the core democratic values are, we still have to then fall back on, if you call it this, moral values of kindness and uh, tolerance. Now, one of the ways uh, to reach out to the middle is to, I mean, I have great difficulties with the term counter-narrative because mm. then you're still in a, in a juxtaposition. But the other story, um, I think there are a lot of projects also, I feel, in your field, the storytelling projects means showing how things can be done in a different way. And we've heard great stories already today. Mm. Do you believe that that is a way to reach out to the middle, to tell the other story of, for example, entrepreneurs in northern Iraq or uh, the training uh, uh, schemes of Spark in Gaziantep, the stories we heard today? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's all about communication. And it's all about communicating success, giving hope. One of the things that we're suffering from generally in the West is that hope is failing in relation to fear. These two polarities... Now, now you have to help me out here, yeah. and maybe some people in the audience as well. When I say this, and I put it on Twitter, I get, well, called names. Um, I will not repeat them here, but naive is the nicest one. Yes, yes. Isn't that naive to say, let's call out for hope? I mean, well, I'm with you, I don't take me wrong. No, no, I don't think we call out for hope. We think we have to create it with pe without people necessarily knowing what's going on. Democracies function far better with hope than fear, and that's for sure. I think that one of the interesting things is the way that uncertainty and nostalgia for a lost past is being manipulated today by populists in order to generate fear. This is their story. Make America great again. Well, make America great again implies that it's not great and that it was once before. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's a nostalgic message. And it's also the message that Wilders is putting over here and also Le Pen in, in France. Now, the interesting thing is uncertainty has traditionally been exploited by political and religious leaders. Uh, but we don't actually need um, to resolve uncertainty through providing ideological solutions. This is what fundamentalism tries to do, and populism. They try to provide um, certainty in the place of uncertainty, and what happens is that it very quickly flips into too much certainty and intolerance. So what we need to do is to use constructive uncertainty through things like negotiation, where we take uncertainty as a given in the human condition, but try to use interaction, uh, messaging with each other, communication as a way to live it in, in, a, in a sense that it becomes tolerable and then positive. This morning I was listening to the BBC and they had a whole item on fake news mm. and how over the past couple of months people were spreading fake news about the candidates in the US but of course we have seen in the start of even genocides, how mm. fake news about the other mm. uh, created uh, big upheavals and, and atrocities. Mm. So how can we here in this, in this room, but mm. elsewhere as well, mm. contribute to the, almost the reappreciation of truth and the search for truth again? This is such an interesting question. We need to infuse the facts that are important to us with tremendous emotional power. Okay, can you see that as again? This is a good... <laughs> you say we need to infuse the facts that are... Trans that are important to us with tremendous emotional power. Tremendous, the yeah. reason that fo fake news is catching on is that we actually live in a post-ideological age where conspiracy theories and apocalyptic visions 
are the dominant way, especially for young people to think. And this means that um, they have their facts, and if you like, someone who's interested in truth has theirs. Now, it, just because everyone is entitled to their opinion does not mean everyone's opinion is equally valid. And mm. we need to make sure that if we uh, touch on something we think is true and important to us, we give it a lot of emotional weight, because it's emotions that change minds, not arguments. And this is the failure of the counter-narrative. Um, they have their facts. Did you hear this? It's emotions that change minds, not arguments. I really like that. Anybody mm. who can put this on a Twitter tweet for me? I'm sorry, but this is also reaching out okay. to people who are not with us. Um, how do we do that? I mean, do you see examples, role models in politics, in art, in culture, in business, where you say, yep, yeah, that's somebody I really admire for mm. you know, putting arguments through emotions and changing, therefore, the narrative? Well, if you've got to admire Trump for his ability to do that, if you're talking just about the technical ability to do it. Can we have an example on the progressive, progressive side, <laughs> maybe? Well, the problem is we lack real leaders in the West at the moment who could do this, but F.D. Roosevelt was an example of someone who could. He turned things on their head. When people attacked him, he turned the emotions around and floored them with them. I think that we need to understand that uh, the communications industry is uh, a very important partner in our ability to actually get our message over. But it's not got to be just about the emotion. It's got to carry weight, the weight of truth. I mean, the great Dutch philosopher Spinoza made clear that um, just because something is true doesn't mean that it has extra power to change minds. We need to actually attach it to emotions. And, You're a uh, great fan of Spinoza, aren't you? Yeah, well, I spent six years of my life studying Spinoza and, you know, mm -hmm. and giving the Spinoza lecture next week, by the way, in the Paradiso, so if anyone's interested. <laughs> still, tickets still available? <laughs> next Sunday. Next Sunday. Well, I mean, going, I mean, what, what would be your lesson then of, uh, from this big Dutch philosopher who also lived in, uh, in, in very in dire times when it comes to tolerance and he acceptance? He did indeed, and he was in this very building. Um, I think that... There are so many messages, but I'll bring it down to two. If we want to understand extreme states of mind, we need to understand emotions, not ideology. The ideology is a cloak, uh, so it's something that's held to disguise the emotion. The second thing is we must work very hard to deal with uncertainty in terms of human interaction. One of the great things ab about entrepreneurship is it leads to increased interaction with a different range of people. So, if we put that together with the concept and the skill of negotiation, we have a recipe for, I think, um, embedding true democratic values. And I'll finish with just this, uh, on this point, that Amsterdam actually had the core of all the core democratic values long before the Netherlands became a democracy simply because the everyday practices of business, cooperation and trust uh, embedded uh, tolerance, freedom and a court system that the people could trust. Go to whenever they needed adjudication, they could trust the judges to give them uh, a fair hearing. Sitting on the throne, pleading for negotiations, curiosity, an open mind. Could I please have a warm applause for David Kenning? Thank you very Thank you. much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very Lovely. much. Thank you. Well, we still